God calls his people as a congregation together to sing his praises and worship him. He makes springs pour water into the ravines. It flows between the mountains. They give water to all the beasts of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. The birds of the air nest by waters. They sing among the branches. He waters the mountains from his upper chambers. The earth is satisfied by the fruit of his work. He makes grass grow for the cattle and plants for man to cultivate, bringing forth food from the earth, wine that gladdens the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread that sustains his heart. The trees of the Lord are well watered, the cedars of Lebanon that he planted. There the birds make their nests, the stork has its home in the pine trees, the high mountains belong to the wild goats, the crags are a refuge for the conies. The moon marks off the seasons, and the sun knows when to go down. You bring darkness, it becomes night, and all the beasts of the forest prowl. The lions roar for their prey and seek their food from God. The sun rises and they steal away. They return and lie down in their dens. Then man goes out to his work, to his labor until evening. How many are your works, O Lord, in wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. There is the sea, vast and spacious, teeming with creatures beyond number, living things both large and small. There the ships go to and fro, and the Leviathan, which you formed, to frolic there. These all look to you, to give them their food at the proper time. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are satisfied with good things. When you hide your face, they are terrified. When you take away their breath, they die and return to the dust. When you send your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the earth. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. He who looks at the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. May my meditation be pleasing to him as I rejoice in the Lord. But may sinners vanish from the earth and the wicked be no more. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Praise the Lord. Let's sing God's praises now from Psalm 104a. Our scripture reading this morning is from Matthew chapter 6 continuing in our sermon series to the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 25 to the end of the chapter. Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear, is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Steve, can you come lead us in prayer? What was that sign, Steve? Dear children, dear children, I like full custody, not just weekend business. God. 
In other words, God is divorced from his bride. Isn't that nice? That, in the modern sense, is heresy. That's heresy. That's heresy. To basically imply that God the Father is divorced from his bride and only partially. Which is interesting because the other option is that God isn't married yet and he has kids. Another problem. Just a wee bit. I mean, Paul even talks about the children of God are not manifest till the end in Romans 8. So how do we even know who the children are? You could go with that for a long time. <laughs> Thinking is gone. Well, our text today draws out the application of what it means to serve one of two masters, either God or wealth, God or money, depending on your translation, perhaps God or mammon. And so what we see today is that uh, for those who invest their lives in the kingdom, Jesus gives a practical demonstration of what it means to serve God rather than wealth. And this is one where the rubber meets the road. Real practical teaching here. We kind of broke this up, but notice verse 24, how verse 24 sets the context for what Jesus goes on to say in verse 25. Jesus says, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, see our text is developing the idea of what it means to serve one master or the other. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? He's, of course, contrasting serving God as opposed to serving wealth, which consisted of in this culture food, raiment, ability to live comfortably, etc. But we read this and we think, you know, really, Jesus? Do not worry about food? And the timing of this text is in our sermon series is most appropriate for us. Many of our families here, of course, work outside to earn our living for our families and seasonal businesses. And if your situation is anything like my family life, early March is a tough part of the year financially, right? Money's almost gone, or is gone, and the bills are stacking up, the expenses are going out, and you don't really know when you're going to get your first chance at, you know, making a good, a good, uh, a good wage with work beginning. You don't know when work's going to start. And on top of that, the economy appears to be teetering right on the edge with a tremendous potential for a bust ahead. Oh, and the weather's not cooperating either. How cold was it last night? 10 below, 15 below, with piles of snow everywhere? What's the natural response? What's the natural response? Well, that sort of depends sort of depends on what you believe. It depends on what master you serve. The natural response in our day, and as I'm prone to this as, as much as any of you are, is to worry how the physical needs of the family will be met. How is it going to last? And the same is true of those who heard Jesus teach in person. They faced, remember, they faced a great insecurity coming up in their future, and Jesus re was preparing them for all kinds of difficulty, not the least of which would have been financial insecurity when they got cast out of the synagogues 
and shunned by that culture. But the application of following Jesus seems to be pretty straight line from there to here. It's obviously very practical in, in regards to kingdom life. Notice where Jesus draws their attention in verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Worry won't change anything for the better. There's some ambiguity in the Greek whether this is a measure of height or stature or if this is a measure of time. Jesus says not one, not any worry can add one measure to you. could be height. It could be read as length of life. So why do it? In fact, the implication is that worry is actually detrimental to life because it creates all kinds of problems. But Jesus takes them to what we call the natural world in order to teach a spiritual lesson to those who believe in God. And pay attention to the examples. They're important. They're not random. Birds of the air and wildflowers of the land. Do you see a pattern there? Do you see an order there? Birds of the air or of the sky and plants of the land. He takes them to examples of heaven and earth. It's as if Jesus uses the animals of the heavens and plants of the earth, God's relationship to the physical world, to teach that God cares even more for his heavens and earth, his covenant people. Think about those details. It's very interesting to think about the way the Hebraic mindset worked. The argument, and it's a logical argument here that Jesus gives, the argument given to people who believe in God, and remember that Jesus is not dealing with atheists here, he's not trying to prove the existence of God, he assumes in his covenant people that they do believe that God exists. The argument is that God cares for the natural world and that being so, how much more does he care for his and provide for his own children whom he loves more? The true heavens and earth. It is from the lesser to the greater kind of an argument. It's interesting how that works. There's a good example here of what is important in the biblical story when it comes to the story of the heavens and the earth. Are you not much more valuable to God than the birds? Will he not much more clothe you with what you will need than the grass and wildflowers that is thrown into the oven to bake bread? That's how they heated their ovens. They would make their dough up and they would have a like a pottery oven and they would put the grass that was beautiful in the field, wildflowers included, into the oven to bake bread. And Jesus makes the comparison to Solomon, who wore his purple robes. Um, one of the things about this, this world is that um, there were certain colors that the dye was extremely expensive. So you have the idea of purple dye later in the New Testament being um, used with regard to someone who had converted. And so this shirt, I wore the shirt sort of as a blue, but it's close to purple. In this world of the Bible, this kind of clothing was extremely expensive. They didn't have machine clothing, but this color, brightness, was worth probably an art equivalent to like buying a diamond ring, thousands of dollars. And there were many wildflowers in Jesus' day that um, he was probably referencing here that had a blue or purple color to them which, of course, is the comparison to Solomon, 
who wore those very expensive purple dyed clothes. But it's a call to faith in God as our Heavenly Father. And by the way, the imagery that Jesus uses speaks directly both to men and women. Do you see the examples in our text? Verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Who did the sowing and the reaping in this culture? The men. And then verse 28. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Who labored and spin to spin thread out of wool in this culture? The women. And so the, even the examples are presented to cover the reality of all of God's people. This is not something that is specifically prone to men or specifically prone to women. Jesus hits them both by using the examples that he used. The women were in charge of producing clothing for their families, usually from the wool of sheep. And we, could, we should recognize how easy we have it. Mothers, can you imagine making all of your clothes from raw wool? No sewing machines. We have our farm tractors and industrial clothing manufacturing machinery that technological advance is something to thank God for and his blessing to the whole world. And it makes it a bit different for us to sort of translate this because we don't wonder where our food comes from specifically or our clothing comes from specifically. We tend to wonder where our money will come from to buy what we need and if we will have enough money to provide for our needs into the future, particularly when, it, when we age. So there's a bit of a cultural shift that we have to understand and apply this um, from this cultural context of Jesus' day to our modern situation. But the basic point remains. Verse 31 So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Faith in God and worry over money are incompatible. That's what Jesus is developing, just as surely as it is incompatible to serve two masters, God or wealth. And that's the lesson that Jesus is speaking to his people. And it's a lesson that's easily forgotten in our day too, right? Isn't it so easy to be driven by concern and worry and fear over physical concerns? Food and drink and clothing. But you cannot have worry over your sustenance and faith in God our Father at the same time. One of those things will cancel out the other. Faith in God's provision cancels out fear and worry over money and fear. Or worry over money cancels out faith in God. They really displace one or the other. That's the relationship that Jesus presents it. And his response, Jesus focuses on the family relationship that his people have to God as the ground for their faith. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them. And the imagery of what is family, right? A father and a mother, if they are godly, provide for their family. Godly fathers and mothers make it their business to do whatever it takes to provide for their families. And so we could say, from the lesser to the greater, how much more... Is that true of God, the source of all fatherhood and motherhood? So the ground of this banishing of worry is faith in the family relationship between God and his children. God is a responsible father who provides for his children, and that is the intellectual basis 
for faith. It's not something that's irrational. It's not even something that doesn't have evidence. It is a very logical argument that Jesus presents here to his people who believe in God. Now contrast that with the pagans, the Gentiles. What do they do? They don't have a father, right, in heaven. And so what are the Gentiles driven by? What are the pagans driven by? They are driven by material things as the ultimate goal of life. If you don't have a father in heaven, then you are on your own. So this works its way out. What you believe will dictate how you approach this issue of wealth, food and drink, and clothing. And you can even see how that plays out in our world, unfortunately, even among those, many of those who call themselves Christians. And the idea of chasing or running after material security is really a description of a slave serving a master. How did the people walk around with slaves in this day? Where did the slaves walk? Behind the master. They would chase after the master to make sure that they do the master's will. So simply here, Jesus is expounding or expanding on what it means to serve either God or money, and he uses the Gentile world to shame his covenant people who claimed to have faith in God. This would have been a shame thing for Jesus to say, don't be like the Gentiles. It would have been an insult. So rather than running after food and drink, clothing and money, God's servants are called to be focused on something else. Verse 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. The imagery here is really of an obedient son or daughter focused on accomplishing his father's will. And unfortunately, the song that we sing that's based on this verse doesn't really capture the full context of what's going to be added to you. It doesn't set the context in the... in the. It's just kind of a one-liner. But the context there is between the difference between two masters and what it means to serve two different masters. And Jesus is telling them to make the coming of the kingdom or rule of God their first priority. Focus on the righteousness of God first. And a reference there, I think, is directly to Jesus Christ himself. A person, rather than a raw, powerless, moral code with which, with which they were familiar. The Pharisees focused on righteousness, but that wasn't what Jesus was talking about. Paul called Jesus Christ our righteousness. So focus on the coming of the kingdom rule of God and Messiah and all these matters of food and drink and clothing will be given you. Sort of a rough paraphrase translation. And again, we're working here with a story that was unfolding. So what does it mean in our context? We don't quite look forward to the rule of God, the kingdom of God. We live in it. We don't look forward to the righteousness of Messiah. We now have the righteousness of God. Particularly with the fulfilled work of Messiah. So the story has unfolded since these days that Jesus spoke here. But the same priority still holds true for us. If the coming of the rule of God and Messiah's work was the overriding priority of the early disciples, how much more should it be our priority for those who invest our lives in the ongoing kingdom of God that rules over all? See, it's an argument from the lesser to the greater. We have a little bit of a different orientation with a fulfilled kingdom, with the arrival of the kingdom of God, but the pattern priority is the same. God takes care of his servants, his children, who participate with him 
in his kingdom rule through the gospel. And that's where we're called to exercise faith. Verse 34, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Do what's in front of you. Do what you have in front of you. Let tomorrow take care of itself. Easy to say, hard to do. And I should add here that, just to be plain, that choosing faith rather than worry does not negate the proper role of work. This congregation knows how to work. We know that as part of our ministries, part of our worship. Faith is opposed to worry, but faith is not opposed to work. And I believe that the trouble that Jesus foresees here, the days of trouble that they were facing, relates specifically to the time of tribulation and persecution that would strip his Jewish followers particularly of all of their possessions and all of their security in that world. When they got cast out of the synagogue because of their faith in Messiah, they would be impoverished overnight. That would be the days of trouble that Jesus is foreseeing for them specifically. But even the examples that Jesus gave of the birds of the air being provided for by God's hand assumes activity and work on their part to receive the food. Do birds work? Yes, they do. They're very active. They hunt. They fly. If you have yard birds, chickens, they're what? Scratching. They're hunting. They're going all over the place. They're still working, even though their provision is provided for them. In fact, Jesus assumes a general legitimacy of sowing and reaping and storage up in barns as the general means of God's provision. Faith is opposed to worry. Faith is not opposed to diligent work. So we have to think carefully about that. In fact, I think that this aspect of work is assumed by Jesus and it makes it a fascinating text to, 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 to consider because really Jesus is working from the background of Proverbs, places in Proverbs like Proverbs 6 where it says, Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. What Jesus is teaching is in conformity with Proverbs 6. And the birds don't gather but they still have to hunt their food every day. And if you think even more about this, it's interesting that Jesus presents God's provision as part of the natural world. Jesus equates the natural process of life as God's provision and care. And we tend to put those things in different categories, right? We think of the natural world out there as the way the world works, and God works whenever he does something supernatural. God steps in. And we don't realize how far we are from the Hebraic mindset. The way the Bible presents it is not that way at all. And one of the interesting things about this is I've seen and talked with other Christians. When you get yourself into that dichotomy, you're always looking for what? The miracle. You're not seeing God in the way the world works. But Jesus is saying that the way the world works is the way God works. There is no real dichotomy in a hard and fast sense between what we call natural processes and supernatural processes. And the people that I have seen that are dominated by that way of thinking end up with very barren lives because they only see the miracle as God working. It's a very unhealthy thing. I see it particularly with the charismatics that I know and discuss things with. 
So God is not presented by Jesus as outside of the natural process. God is inside of the natural process, and God is active in amidst even the things that we would call the natural world. The natural order of life is perfectly compatible with God's action, or in other words, God works through the way things work. Does that make sense? God works through the way things work work. See, then you can have faith in everything. You can see God in everything else. That leads to a very full and rich life of seeing every aspect of the natural world as God's work. So that has some profound implications for modern debates surrounding abstract categories of which we call naturalism and supernaturalism. The Bible really does not present to us that kind of a categorical opposition that we tend to think of in our modern debates at all. The centrality of the kingdom is what Jesus emphasized, and when we heed Jesus' call to seek first to strengthen the kingdom of God, to expand the rule of God and his righteousness, we participate in God's work. And then we find freedom from fear and worry. Faith drives out fear and worry. Fear and worry are very much related. And you know, there's something very liberating about serving God rather than wealth. Isn't that free? Look around in the culture that we see around us Where is that fear coming from? People afraid of losing their livelihoods, of losing their jobs, of losing their place. They are gripped by fear because they are serving our culture's definition of wealth. You give up that idol and instead worship God, you are liberated. It's another example how faith drives out fear. When God's people live in faith that their Father in heaven will provide for all their needs, they will never face the tyranny of wealth and worry about tomorrow. This is just another example of how faithful kingdom living is life without fear. Let's pray.